All right, John chapter number 7. Look down in your Bibles there at verse number 1. John chapter 7 says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Uh, when it says Jewry there, it's talking about Judea. And um, Jesus, we, we get this later in the chapter, his time's not yet come. So he knows that there's people out to kill him, so he's not going up just yet. And um, he's basically staying away from that area. Verse 2 says, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. So his family, and then it says, For neither did his brethren believe in him. So at this point, his family, his brethren, they didn't believe on him. They didn't believe that he was a savior. They're you know, they're basically just saying, okay, look, if you, know, if you want to be known, if you want the world to know about you, you want to you know, go up to the feast. What greater place to go, what greater event than go to this feast? This is where everybody's congregating together. You know, do your works there. Do your miracles there. Do like, you know, if you, want, if you really want people to know about it, then don't hide yourself. But they obviously didn't understand, and he answers them and, and basically tells them um, why he's not going. He says, in verse 6, then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is all way ready. Jesus knew that there were people going about to kill him. And he's saying, My time is not yet come. He knew the work laid out before him that he had to do. He knew there was a plan for him, and he was being wise and not stepping into something, at least not at this time. See, they would have expected him to come with his brethren, with his family up to this feast, and that would have been real easy to just be like, here he is. Now, he does go up to this feast. He does go up to the tabernacle, and he does end up teaching and showing himself, but he did it in his time, in God's time, not in the time that his family is trying to get him to do it, and other people are saying, oh, no, you do this. Look, he did it in God's time, the way that, it was, that he was supposed to do it. Um, Verse number 7, I think, is a real profound statement. He says, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. And flip over, if you would. We're going to keep our fingers here in John 7, but we're going to go to John 15 real quick, because this concept comes up again about the world. He says, he says to his brethren that don't believe on him yet. Now, they do end up believing on him later, later but they don't believe on him yet. He says, The world cannot hate you. It's impossible for the world to hate you, but me, it does hate. The Bible, Jesus is saying, the world hates me, and that's why the world wanted to kill him. They had wanted him to kill him already. Why did they want to kill him? Why did they hate him? He says, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. And here we see that Jesus Christ was a preacher of righteousness. Jesus' main goal, obviously, was to come and to seek and to save that which is lost. But that's not all he did. He also preached against sin, which is evident here when he says that he testifies of the world that the works of the world are evil. And he, he testifies and preaches against it so much that the world hates him and they want to have him killed. So don't tell me that Jesus didn't preach righteousness. Yes, he preached grace. Yes, we see him teaching on the love of God and, and how people could be saved. And he does that even in this chapter about anyone that believes on him. That's his main goal and his main focus in teaching and preaching. But that's not all he did. The world does not want their, the, the darkness of this world to be reproved, to be open, to be visible in the sight. The evil works of the world does not like to be brought to light. But that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus was the light of the world. And the light sheds light on the darkness and on the dark things. And that's why the darkness hates the light because it exposes it. It exposes all the evil works. Look, you're in John 15. Look at verse number 18. Jesus, again, Jesus speaking, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. And this is what Christians today need to understand. 
If you are of the world, if you are just real worldly, if you just look like you belong in this world and you're completely of the world, you do everything that is of the, like any people who are unsaved, you look exactly like them, you like the same things, you do the same things, there's like no difference about you, the world's not going to hate you at all because the world loves their own. But if you're going to live godly, if you're going to live righteously, First of all, obviously being saved, you're not of the world once you're saved. You're, you're of the Father. You're of Jesus Christ. You are born of Him. But when you decide to walk in God's laws and walk in God's ways, you know, God has called us to be separate, to be a peculiar people. God's called us out of this world and say, look, in times past, yes, you were in this world. You were of this world and the world loved you. And you love the world and you, you know, all the things of the world, we're fine with you. But God has called us out of that. God has saved us. Jesus has saved us from our sins. We are, we are not to be of this world. We ought to be separate. We ought to be a different. People ought to be able to look at you as a Christian, as someone who claims to love God, and be able to see a difference between you and the rest of the world. When, in, in conversation and deeds, and, and you know, the way that you act, the way that you talk, the way you present yourself ought to be upright. You ought to be above reproach. You ought not to, to bring yourself down to the standards of this world. Whether it be in your speech, your communication, your, your, the form of language that you use, whether it be in the, the way you entertain yourself, the things that you discuss, the things that you talk about. You know, the world's fine with telling the dirty, dirty jokes. The world's fine with talking about the latest gossip that's going on in Hollywood. The world's fine with all of this stuff. We ought to be different. This isn't what we should be focused on. We ought not to be of this world. And what's going to come with that is the world's going to hate you. And if you really think that you are following Jesus, because there's so many people have this idea, it's like, well, I'm just following Jesus, I'm doing everything He wants me to do. If the world's not hating you, then you're not following Jesus, unless you think you're better than Jesus somehow. Because the world hated Jesus Christ. The world wanted Him dead. The world spat in His face. The world did all these things. They hated Jesus Christ. And if you think you're, you're truly following Jesus and doing everything that He would want you to do, and you are experiencing no hate from the world whatsoever, you're doing something wrong, my friend. Otherwise, you think you must be better than Jesus. That's why he says in verse 20 of John 15, he says, The servant is not greater than his Lord. Now, are you Jesus Christ's Lord or are you his servant? We're obviously not his Lord. We're his servant. The servant is not greater than the Lord. He says, If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So those that, that, that have kept Jesus' saying, they obey him, hey, if you're, if you're walking and following Jesus' steps and do what's right, they're going to listen to you too because they're going to hear the words of truth and they're going to appreciate that and love that and respect that. But if they're not, if they're of the world, if they're persecuting Jesus Christ, you better bet they're going to persecute you too. Otherwise, you are not walking the way that Jesus wants you to. You're not walking in His footsteps as so many people like to say that they are and will claim that they are. Hey, if you're not getting hate from this world, you are not doing what Jesus Christ walk in the way that he would have you to do. He was a preacher of righteousness. The world hated him because he testified of the works of the world that they're evil. We ought not to just keep our mouth silent and, and, and be afraid to expose how wicked Hollywood is, how wicked whatever. I mean, you name it. It's easy to pick on, on the movies and on the music just because they're so common. It's so much of a part of our culture. But there's so many things that are wicked sins. The fornication, the adultery, the drunkenness, the, you know, the promiscuity, all of this, this, this the, the homosexuality now that's just being accepted. It's, we need to, to rebuke the works of this world and the evil and testify that the works thereof are evil. And not just hold back and be afraid, well, if I were to say that, then, then someone might hate me or my family members might not want to talk to me. Well, so be it. Jesus Christ talked of it. Jesus Christ spoke of it. And a lot of people hated him because of it. But if you want to be doing what's right, that's what's right. And, and don't, be, don't be afraid and, and expect it. And, you know, this is something we could take as, a, as an encouragement even. Not that you're looking forward to people hating you. You know, it's, um, you know, it's not a pleasant experience to go through. But you should rejoice. Because if you get that hatred, hey, they did it to Jesus. Just remember that. They did it to him. I must be doing something right. And, and glory to God 
if God sees you worthy, you know, like the like in the book of Acts, we kept going through that. Remember that that how happy they 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 leaped with joy when they suffered a beating because of their faith in Jesus Christ. They caught they counted it a happy thing. And we ought to do the same thing. I mean, when the world hates you, when the world is, is, is despising you and attacking you and coming against you, count it all joy. Because that's exactly what they did to Jesus Christ. That's exactly what they did to all of God's prophets. And if that's going to be coming against you, hey, praise the Lord. Is it fun to go through? No. But pray, you, you can have comfort and solace knowing that you're in good company. And knowing that you're probably a lot closer to doing what God wants you to do when, you're, when you start to receive that type of reaction from the world. Right? I'm not talking about from other saved you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, but when you're getting that reaction from the world, the world hates you, um, you're probably doing something right. Well, let's, um, oh, and one more verse. And James, you don't have to turn there. James 4, 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Another reason why you ought not to, to want to be fitting in with this world so much. The Bible says if you're a friend of the world, if you get along great, hey, you and the world, man, you're just two peas in the pod. You get along just fine. The Bible says you're, in, you're at enmity with God. You're God's enemy. God looks at you not as his friend, but as his enemy, which is all the more reason. Again, the world and the lusts of the world, the, the, the lust of the eyes and... Um, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but are of the world. And um, we ought not to get caught up into those things and, and be focused on uh, following Jesus Christ and His righteousness and, and not worrying about the things of this world and not associating ourselves with them so that we don't have to be called an enemy of God. There needs to be that distinction. We need to have that separation. Go, let's go back to John chapter 7. Keep reading here in verse number 8. He, so he's still talking to his brother. And he says, Go ye up to this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. So he explains to him, Look, it's, you, go on, you go on without me. Go on ahead. My time's not full come yet. Verse number 9 says, When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. So he stayed behind and they, st they, they took off. Verse number 10, But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So he didn't make a big show of it. He, did, he does end up going up to the feast, but he's, he's just kind of, he just, he just kind of goes and blends in. He doesn't go up with his family. Just, he, he goes up to the feast. He goes up as it were in secret. Verse number 11, then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? So people, the Jews wanted him. They want, and again, we saw from verse 1, he says that because the Jews sought to kill him. The Jews wanted him dead. They had enough of him already. They had enough of his miracles and enough of his converting people unto him. And they were seeking him at this, at this Feast of Tabernacles. But he went up secretly. Verse number 12 says, And there was much murmuring about among the people concerning him. For some said, He is a good man. And others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. And again, that's what it boils down to, especially with the, for the Jews. You know, you either... Love them or hate him. You either thought, hey, he's a man of God, he's a good man, he's doing all these miracles, or you're saying he is a great deceiver and a devil. And you, and you kind of have to fall on one of the two sides when you look at what Jesus was saying. He either was just some great deceiver trying to get people to think, hey, I'm God in the flesh, hey, I'm the Son of God. You know, if he wasn't, then yeah, that is a great deceiver, but he proved himself to be as is obvious that he was and he is the Son of God. But, um, you kind of have to make your conclusion one or the other. He either is or isn't of God. There's no, there's no in between um, with the, with when, you, when you measure what Jesus Christ actually said. Verse 13 says, Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Here we get to see how much power and influence the Jews actually had. The, the Jews that were in power, the rulers, the Pharisees, these people who, who kind of, you know, they wielded a lot of power in the land so much that the people were afraid to even speak about Jesus Christ. <coughs> Those that thought he was a good man, the Jews were willing to kick them out of the synagogue <coughs> and isolate that person. 
just for having that belief, it made people afraid to even speak of him. Verse number 14 says, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So now Jesus is getting a little bit more bold and, and he's not, you know, he's coming out a little bit more of, you know, and actually teaching. Verse number 15 says, And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? And this is kind of funny, too, because this is how the world looks. Um, the, the same attitude that people have these days. So they look at Jesus Christ and he wasn't a student of the Pharisees, right? And that's what they would say, oh, he didn't go, you know, he didn't go to Bible college. He's, he's an unlearned man. How does he even know letters? Because he didn't go through our whole schooling and system of teaching, so he must be ignorant. And this is the way the world will look at you today, too. Like, you can't know anything. Oh, man, you must be an imbecile if you didn't go to college, if you didn't go to university. And this is the way the world looks at you, and it's just a bunch of nonsense. Because you can go to school and come out being a complete idiot, just as much as you were beforehand, and not learn anything, and still get your stupid piece of paper that says, oh, I've got a Bachelor of the Arts, or Bachelor of Science, or I'm a Master's of whatever, and... and still be not very intelligent. And on the other hand, you can never go to those institutions like so many successful men of the past haven't and be brilliant and get your learning from reading books, from doing things, be very educated, be very well read, yet completely not respected by the world because you didn't go and pay, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to, to get a little piece of paper that, that someone put a rubber stamp on and says, okay, now you're smart. You passed some tests. It's ridiculous. And that's what they look at Jesus Christ. I mean, who had more wisdom than Jesus Christ walking on this earth? Nobody. Second, you know, the second person would be Solomon who had wisdom. But, but Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He knew more than anyone. And they're just amazed. Like, oh, wow, this, he's never learned. How can this guy know letters? How can this guy read and write? And, um, you know, I, I, I'm sure I'll get a lot of that, too. You know, people, not, not necessarily people marveling at me, but, but, you know, basically talking down because I didn't go to Bible college. Well, look, you don't have to go to a Bible college to know your Bible. You could learn and read and memorize and study uh, probably a lot more than they require at some institution and, and whatever their standards are. Hey, if your ha standards are set high and you want to learn something, you can learn it all on your own. And you can be taught in other ways as well. You don't have to go to an institution. You're going to church. You're, you're, you're hearing good preaching. You're being taught by other people who, who are very skilled at the word. And you're reading and studying on your own. There's no reason why you can't be qualified to hold a pastor a position. You don't find Bible college in the Bible anywhere. That's not a requirement of God. Go look at, go look at the, the, the scriptures that talk about the qualifications of a pastor. One of them is not, you have to have your degree from Bible college. But um, anyways, that's, the world's going to view you as ignorant if you, don't, if you don't go through their methods the same way they looked at Jesus. But look at what Jesus said. He answered them in verse 16. He says, Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine but his that sent me. And this is something that we need to remember. You know, our doctrine, the doctrine that we have, it shouldn't just be something that we come up with on our own. It should be God's doctrine. It should be the doctrine that is found completely in the Bible. We don't need to be twisting Scripture to form, to, to, to fit whatever our view is. Just your personal view on things. Say, well, I don't think this is right. I think, I think it's wrong to do whatever and then just try to make the Bible fit your opinion and fit your own doctrine. It should be God's doctrine that we're learning and that we're getting from the Bible, that we're receiving from Him instead of making the Bible to fit our own agenda. And people do that all the time with any sin. You want to list in the book. I mean, that's why now they, of all things, they've come out with this, with this sodomite Bible. Because they want to make that okay. In their minds, they say, well, we want this to be okay, so we're just going to make it okay. Instead of just dealing with what the Bible actually says of having their blood be upon them, if man lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, that they've committed abomination and that they'll be surely put to death. That's what the Bible says. But people want to make their own doctrines and come up out of the, the desires of their own hearts and justify their sins. So they try to make the Bible fit to whatever their own 
personal doctrine is that they want. Let's keep reading here. We're in verse 16, so look at verse 17. He says, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Again, very prof there's so many profound statements. When Jesus speaks, man, we really got to listen because his, his words have so much truth in them. You want to gain discernment in what's right and what's wrong? The Bible says, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. We want to know what true doctrine is from God's Word. It's not just enough to study and to read. And that's why you'll often find these, these people, these professors, these, you know, these guys who spend all this time reading and reading and studying and reading books and, and, and they, you know, memorizing scripture, doing all this stuff, but they're not going out and doing God's will and doing the work of the evangelist and doing the work that God has set before them. They're just sitting there studying. They come up with all kinds of false doctrine. It happens all the time. That's why you see like these, you know, typically, stereotypically you'll find that Calvinists, people who, who believe that, you know, God is foreordained people and God picks and chooses this person is going to heaven, this person goes to hell. They tend to be these, these intellectual types that, that might be a, a, a smart person, at least in the world's eyes, that, that, are, that are intelligent, that, that the world will look at them and say, oh yeah, you know, they're real scholarly, they're intelligent but they're not going out and doing the works. They, they can't discern the doctrine, whether it is of God or whether it's just of man, i.e. John Calvin. That is a doctrine of man. It's named after a man. It's not Christianity. It's Calvinism. It's not Jesus Christism. It's John Calvinism. When your doctrine is, is named after a person, when what you believe is just named after a person, you better watch out and check it real carefully because it's probably false. Because it's probably coming from a man speaking of himself and not speaking of or from God. If you do God's will, he says, you shall know of the doctrine. That will help you to learn and understand the Bible. See, it's not enough, like I was saying, it's not just enough to read it. You gain so much more by doing things. Think about the things that you learn. I remember when I was in, um, in Illinois, I worked in a machine shop. Okay, and, and we would have a training session. And we would go into the classroom and we'd watch a video and we would take tests and we would go over all of this stuff that we needed to learn to operate our machines. I'll tell you what, the, <laughs> the class was dumb. Okay, I learned very little just from doing the class. But we didn't just do the class, we did hands-on. Most of our time was spent on the floor, actually hands-on, doing the work, doing what we were supposed to do, and then you go back into the class, and the class actually means a little bit more to you when you're already familiar with doing this stuff, because you're like, oh yeah, I know that, oh, and, and it's a lot more familiar, and you could glean and understand a lot more from what they're trying to be taught, as opposed to if you just never did any of it, and you're just receiving all this information. So, you know, the sermon, for example, the sermon I just preached, you know, to apply this to the Bible, I just preached a sermon on winning souls. If you've never gone soul winning before, you know, you're going to get a lot less from a sermon like that. I mean, it's good to know, it's good to get started and to learn from it, but it's not going to sink in as much. It's not going to be as intimately familiar with you, and you're not going to walk away with quite as much as someone who is going out and is doing that work because you've already gotten your hands dirty, so to speak. You've already gone in there and experienced it and felt it and seen it and, and, and did it. And then when you start hearing about it, you can make the connections that will last with you a lot longer. Your memory retention will be a lot greater and it'll have a lot more meaning to you because you're actually doing it. When you start experiencing God's will and, and walking in the way that He wants you to walk, you will understand the preaching so much more based on your, the compilation of your experience and God's Word. 
and, and we learn so much by doing. And that's why he's saying here, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. We can judge other people's doctrines. The more you're walking in God's will and doing God's will, the more you're, you're visiting the fatherless and the widows and preaching the gospel to the poor and, and doing these things and doing his will, you will see clearer through the doctrine and be able to discern God's word and what is right and what is wrong. You'll be able to judge righteous judgment, which we're going to get to that real soon in verse 24. Let's keep reading here. Verse 18, he says, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. That's what we ought to be seeking God's glory, not our own. When we preach a doctrine, it's not because it's becoming from us. It's coming from God. And it should bring God glory, not ourselves. Verse 19, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? And I like how he says there, right? I mean, Jesus Christ says right there, he says, none of you keep the law. They think, they, see, they were trusting in Moses' law to be saved. They thought that they believed Moses and they believed in his law. He says, none of you keep the law. None of you is perfect. Why go ye about to kill me? He's saying, you know, you don't even keep the law, so why are you going about to kill me? Verse number 20, they says, The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil, who goeth about to kill thee? Now, it's kind of funny that they gave him that response because we see from the author of the Bible in verse number 1 that they sought to kill him. Right? It says, Because the Jews sought to kill him. He's here. He's speaking in the temple. And... The Jews were there and they were marveling. The Jews marveled with, with his, what he's saying. The Jews are the one that sought to kill him. The Jews are marveling. He says, he flat out just says, why are you going about to kill me? I know you're trying to kill me. And they say, who goes about to kill you? Oh, we're not trying to kill you. Who goes about to kill you? I guess they thought that Jesus was just some crazy conspiracy theorist, right? Like, oh, you're just not. Yeah, who's going about? You have a devil. Who's going about to kill you? You don't know what you're talking about. And it's kind of funny how when there's these, these truths are being exposed and he flat out just says, you're going about to kill me. I know you're going about to kill me. And he did know because it was the truth. How... The people who are involved with that will just, just, oh yeah, you're, that's just some crazy conspiracy. And that's what's going on even today. People will lay, oh, that's some crazy, that's not going on. You know, there's, there's not evil people out there trying to hurt anybody. You're just nuts. You just, you're a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist. Because you think that there's evil people in the world trying to, to control other people and enslave them. You must be nuts. Uh, no, it's been going on forever. <laughs> and you're ignorant and, and very naive if you think there's not people out there trying to do these things. So, but there's nothing new under the sun. These people thought that Jesus had a devil and, and thought he was just some crazy conspiracy theorist. Um, <clears throat> even in verse, jump down real quick to verse 25. It says, Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this, is not this he whom they seek to kill? Everybody knew the truth, yet they're saying, Who goes about to kill you? Right? They're denying it. They, they don't want, they, they're, they're not owning up to it. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. And we covered this a couple weeks ago. I'm not going to go into this again about how Jesus healed on the Sabbath day and all of a sudden they're, they're all mad and want to kill him for healing somebody when they go and they, they remove a piece of flesh from a person and they say that's just fine, that they're in obedience to the law. And that's where he says here in verse 24, judge not according to the appearance but judge righteous judgment. And this is a great verse to show those people because Jesus Christ is saying, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Oh, I thought you said, you know, Jesus said to judge not. And here he says, judge righteous judgment. I thought Jesus is telling you to judge. He's not saying judge not. He says, judge not. Read the rest of the verse. Oh, according to the appearance. So we shouldn't just make our judgment just based on appearance. We have to judge righteous judgment. Righteous judgment digs deeper 
than just what's on the surface. On the surface, things look a certain way. You shouldn't just snap to judgment on that. We need to have a deeper understanding. There's these people, they didn't understand the Sabbath thing. On the surface, it just looks like, oh, he's breaking the law because he healed somebody. They don't understand the law. They don't understand the intent. They don't understand what the Sabbath is even for. And they can't see their own hypocrisy in, in performing a circumcision. And that's not breaking the Sabbath. Yet Jesus healing someone, they said, is. Um, they can't see that because they're not judging righteous judgments. And we, need to make, we do need to make sure, this is important. I mean, don't overlook this. It's easy to, to condemn those that say, you know, because you know, these people, it's so common, they parrot us, judge not, judge not, you know, these fake Christians that don't even know the Bible, they just like hearing their two words, and that's all they know, and that's what they repeat over and over again. Oh, don't judge me, don't judge me. When they're probably more full of judgment than anybody, but the Bible says, judge not according to the appearance. But we need to take that to heart so that we don't get caught up in the same thing. We shouldn't be judging people just based on appearance. We need to be judging righteous judgment. And judging someone on appearance, that's going to be a respecter of persons. God's not a respecter of persons. So just because someone, you know, is, is in goodly apparent apparel and, and they look nice and they could talk well, doesn't mean that they're a good person. And on the flip side, you see someone dressed in rags. It doesn't mean that they're a wicked person. You know, we need to judge righteous person, uh, judge righteously, um, not just what's on the surface or what the appearance is. But let's keep reading here, verse 25. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. This was pretty. This is pretty interesting too. If you if you read the Bible, if you're familiar, um, some people say the people give all these different reasons why why he's not the Christ. They'll say, oh well, when Jesus when, when the Christ cometh, no one will know what, where he is. We know where he's from. But when Christ cometh, no man knows where he is. And other people say, well, we don't know where he is from, but when Christ comes, we know where he's coming from. Like, they, they say the exact opposite. You see, some people saying one thing and some people saying the other thing. They're all mixed up. And what's even, fun, what's even more interesting is that they think they know where Jesus was from, and they don't. They think, oh, yeah, he's of Galilee, but, they're, but they say later that, you know, well, Christ comes from, um, from Bethlehem. But he came from Galilee. Well, no. Did you bother to ask him? Because he was born in Bethlehem. He did fulfill all that scripture. But we're going to get to that in a little bit. Let's, um, let's keep reading here. Where was so, so Jesus then cries out because they're saying, you know, when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Verse 28 says, Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. So again, he's saying, you don't know God, because he's come. He said, I can't, you know who I am, and you know where I'm from. But he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. And you don't know the Father. But he does know because he was sent from him. Verse 30. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. And we can learn from this. Jesus spake boldly. He cried out in the temple in front of everybody and, and was saying that um, basically what I just said, that they don't know God. He was preaching exactly right. He was preaching boldly saying, I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. If you're doing God's will, if you're walking the way that he is, we don't have to worry about how things are going to turn out. When your time is the time to come, if you're walking in God's will, when it's time for you to be arrested, if it's time, if it's going to happen to you, if it's time for you to die, if it's time for any of those things, God can will either allow it to happen or he won't. Jesus was boldly preaching in the temple even though they wanted to take him and they wanted to kill him. They wanted him dead. He exposed himself and he opened up himself and he preached God's word boldly. But the reason why it says they didn't lay hands on him is because his hour was not yet come. He was doing God's will 
but it wasn't time for him to be taken and killed yet. So God made sure that that didn't happen, even though he's preaching boldly, even though he's stepping out there. We don't need to, to take that upon ourselves to make sure that we're always in safety. We need to make sure that we're doing God's will regardless, whatever the circumstances may be. Whether we're faced by a king telling us that if we don't bow down and worship the golden image, we're going to be tossed into a furnace. Or whether we're just preaching in church or preaching out on the street, whatever it is. Hey, if someone comes to you and says, I'm going to shoot you if you don't renounce Jesus Christ, well, guess what? We're not going to renounce Jesus Christ. I'm not going to bow down to the false god. I'm not going to do any of that because if it's my time, there's nothing I'm going to do about it anyways. But if it's not my time, then I'm going to make sure I'm doing God's will because he'll make sure that, that it's not my time and I'm going to keep doing what it is that he's laid out for me. And um, we see here, you know, Jesus used wisdom he, he did have it timed appropriately. He knew that they sought about to, got about, went about to kill him. So he wisely didn't go up with his family, but he still went and did God's will. And he still went and preached unto the people and he still made himself known, but he did it in a wiser way so that you know, he wouldn't have gotten taken at that time. And God made sure that even when he did open up his mouth and preach in the temple, that no old man laid hands on him because it wasn't his time. Let's keep reading. Verse number 31 says, And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? Um, you got to understand what this means. At first it could look a little bit confusing because you're saying, well, wait, it's saying that, that many people believed on him. So if they believed on him, then why are they asking when Christ cometh? So if they believe that Jesus is the Christ, why are they saying when Christ cometh? You see, you see what I'm saying here? But what, <laughs> what we need to understand is that this is just a figure of speech. You've you got to understand the, the tone with what they're saying this because Jesus has done all kinds of miracles. Jesus is healing people. Jesus is doing... He's speaking like no man has ever spoken. Okay? He is obviously from God. What they're saying, think about it in more of a sarcastic tone. When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? They're saying it like, what do you expect? How much more can he possibly do before you're going to say this is the Christ? And when you read it like that, it makes sense. Saying, you know, well, when Christ comes, is he going to do more than this guy's done? It's like if you read all the stuff that Jesus did, and if you were there present with him, you'd be thinking, well, duh, yeah, no doubt this guy is the Christ. I mean, He's, he's feed, you know, he fed, we already read, he fed the 5,000. He's doing these miracles. He's healing people, people who are blind and lame from birth. He's just, I mean, they're just being healed. He's performing his miracles. He's speaking these great truths of God. When, when, so, you, so you think this isn't the Christ? Well, when, when the Christ really comes, is he going to do even more than this man has done? That's what they're saying. So don't get too confused with that because these people did believe on him. But they're, they're, they're speaking to the Pharisees. They're speaking to the Jews that didn't believe that, you know, like, what do you expect? What more could he possibly do? Let's keep reading verse 32. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. So here we see now the, the, these officers they commissioned to go arrest Jesus Christ. Jesus was a threat to them. He, um, he had a lot of a lot of influence over the people. He was obviously, people were believing on him. People were getting saved. People were getting converted. And the Pharisees didn't like to see that. So they wanted to put a stop to this. And that's why he, um, they send people to arrest him. Verse 33, Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? And again, we, see, we saw this again in the book of Acts so much, but their attitude, the Jews' racist attitude towards the Gentiles and how much they thought of themselves as so much better than them, that you know, Jesus says, whither, Where I go, you can't come and follow me. You won't be able to find me because where I go, you can't come. And 
they, they interpret that as, oh, is he going to go among the Gentiles? Because they can't go to the Gentiles because they are so much superior to the Gentiles that there's no way they would ever go there. They're saying, is that what he means? Um, it's, it's just crazy how evident that was and how much that was, um, how much they believed that. And so many of them still do believe that today, that they're, that they're literally a special people that because of their ancestry, because of their genealogy, that, that God loves them so much more than everyone else and that they would never lower themselves to speak unto a person of another race or of another culture or whatever. Um, that's just the attitude that they had it's definitely at this time. Verse number 36, What manner of saying is this that he said, Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither you cannot come. 37, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst... Let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. <clears throat> Great salvation verses. Now, notice that he says, He that believeth on me. Jesus knew he was the Christ, obviously. He knew that he was God in the flesh because he says that you need to believe on me. If you believe on me, you will have, as the scripture has said, um, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You have eternal, and this he spake of the, the Holy Ghost. But he says, um, you know, where does scripture ever say to just believe in man? It doesn't anywhere, right? We need to have faith in God. We need to believe in God. Yet Jesus himself was telling people to believe on him. So here, again, you can kind of see where the people had to make a decision. Either he was a great deceiver or he was God in the flesh to be praised and, and, and believed on, right? Because in here he's telling people, look, you need to believe on me. He didn't make any mystery about it. It wasn't any questioning about it. He says, if you believe on me, then you'll get the Holy Spirit, basically. You have rivers of living water. Um, he was not just a man. He was not just some good teacher. Uh, I'll tell you this much too. A good teacher isn't going to tell you to believe on them. I'm not going to stand up here and say, believe on me and you know, you'll have the Spirit of God. No way. No man in history could ever say something like that except for Jesus Christ because of who he was. This, I mean, again, there's so much scripture that proves that he is the Christ or, I mean, or the, the opposite is, is that he was the, the, the worst antichrist the world has ever known, which we know isn't true. But um, that's, that's why so many people, that's why the world hated him, um, because they didn't believe him and they didn't believe that he was uh, the Christ. But um, let's keep reading here. Verse 39 says, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Verse 40, Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, This is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? And I brought this up a little bit earlier in the sermon, but um, let's keep reading the next verse. Verse 42, Hath not the Scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was. But this was such a big focus. You find this in so many chapters of the Bible where they're just, just honing in on where he's from. Where is he from? Whence is he? And, and, you know, how so many people are saying, oh, you know, well, the prophet's not going to come out of Galilee. And it's, they're just completely, it, for one, they're ignorant of the scripture. They're focusing in on the wrong things. But, I still find it kind of strange that no one just thought to ask him, like, where are you really from? Like, did, what's your history? Because it couldn't have been unknown at the time. It just was assumed. And this, is, this can go back to judging righteous judgment, right? They judged according to the appearance. Because he had spent so many years growing up in Galilee, they just assumed that he didn't really come from Bethlehem. Did they know that? Obviously not, because that is where he was born. He was born in Bethlehem. The Bible, the scripture records that. So yes, he fulfilled the prophecies that says that he was going to come from Bethlehem. But they didn't judge righteous judgment. They just all made an assumption of where he was from without knowing the truth or even bothering to find out the truth. 
because you hear something, you might hear something repeated. Oh, he's from Galilee. Oh, yeah. So, because, he, and this is where the source of their false doctrine comes from. It comes from an assumption. So, they start off with something like, oh, well, he's from Galilee. No one questions that, and then they take that statement and dig and say, see, there's no scripture, and they just focus on that one thing. See, there isn't a prophet that comes from Galilee. He has to come from Bethlehem. He has to come of the seed of David. He's not from that. This isn't him, and it's a false accusation. It's not true. But they started with a, with a bad assumption, thinking they even knew where he came from, and they didn't. Um, don't just, when people say things, when people say, oh, the Bible says this, um, oftentimes uh, false doctrine comes from an assumption that's faulty. And then they get you steered off on some, you know, trying to prove something when their, their original premise is false. And that's how so many people get deceived because it looks fancy after you get past the first premise that's false. Then they can just really prove up and down from Scripture. Yeah, see, this isn't right. This doesn't line up. But their starting point was wrong. So we need to, again, analyze everything and don't take anything for granted and prove all things. The Bible says, hold fast to that which is good. Let's keep reading. We're almost done here. Um, see, where were we? Verse number 43. So there was a division among the people because of, again, Jesus Christ causing division. I just preached on that as well. Um, there's always going to be division when it comes down to, to God's Word. No, we're, we're never going to have total unity with the whole world. But hopefully we will within this church. Verse 44, And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. So remember earlier in the chapter, the Pharisees sent out these people to arrest him. So they go out and they hear Jesus actually preaching. And this is where he said, you know, he had said, Yeah, a little while I'm with you, and whether I go, you cannot come. And then he says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Those were the two things that he was, those are the two main passages that are recorded here in the Bible of what he said. And that alone was powerful enough for them to just back off. And he says, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Never man spake like this man spake. The people that went to arrest him, they, they, they couldn't do it. Because, because of the wisdom of his words, just because of what he was saying, that made him doubt. They couldn't, they couldn't take him. They weren't confident in the fact that this guy was a heretic because that's why the Pharisees wanted him arrested. They wanted to shut him up. They wanted to silence him. And they're just like, okay, no man spake like this man spake. And they couldn't, um, they couldn't do it. In verse 47, it says, Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. And it's funny, that pompous attitude. Oh, have any of the, the main line preachers believed on him? Has, has any of the rulers believed on him? You know, you peons, you, you, you people, you don't know the law. You're cursed. You're stupid. You're ignorant. You don't know anything about God. You don't know anything in the Bible. What do you know? We haven't believed on him. We know the truth. You know, if, if none of us have believed on him, then you obviously are wrong and you're in error and you don't even understand that you're in error because we're so smart. And if we haven't accepted him, then you shouldn't either. And this is the standard that they have. And again, it's the same standard of you know, going to college and going to a Bible college and everything else that you'll get today. These people who love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And they love their positions and being lofty. And they love the long robes. And they love the greetings in the marketplace. And they love this, the, their seats at the, at the feasts. They love the praise of men. And they get this big head and this puffed up attitude and this proud attitude, which is why they never get saved because they can't humble themselves enough to receive the free gift and to admit that what they believed was wrong and that their works can't save them and that they need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Yet they think they're so smart. They think they know so much. 
and that the other people are just don't know anything. And there's so many pastors, there's so many preachers out there today that have this type of an attitude that, oh, this people, they don't know anything about God. And that's the way they'd like to keep you, by the way, too. And that's what the Catholic Church did. They, they actually commanded that people did not read their Bibles and that they just got their teaching from the Pope or from the bishop or you know, from, their, from their church and that they would teach them everything. And it was actually um, discouraged for them to do any reading or any studying on their own because they had this same exact type of mentality that, well, you can't understand this. We'll leave it up to us the men of God to interpret it and to, and to teach you what God wants for you and what God means for you. You don't read it on your own when it's the exact opposite is the truth. God wants you to know him. God wants you to read his will. God wants you to read his word and understand it. And if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you which can teach you and lead you into all truth. <clears throat> when people start coming up with that type of that argument. It's, it's a faulty logical argument anyways to say that, oh, well, who has believed on him? Because, it, and it's funny in this instance too, because some of the Pharisees did believe on Jesus, but they were afraid to publicly proclaim that because they, lo they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. But the Bible is very clear that some people did believe. Some people had their faith on Christ. Not everybody was like them. Um, yet they just didn't do it openly. And that's why I said, oh, have any of the Pharisees believed on him? But watch out for that line of thinking. So, Because people try to do that, oh, oh, you believe in a post-tribulation rapture? Oh, well, well, do any of the, you know, the main preachers, uh, does, is anyone else teaching that? You know, these whatever famous guys you want to name, oh, they believed in, in this doctrine, so it must not be true. Don't put that much faith in man. If it's coming from God's word, if that's the source, if this is where his doctrine's from, then we just need to believe it regardless of who believes it. We don't need to be looking to see who believes this or who believes that. If it's coming from scripture, if it's coming from God's word, it's the truth. Um, we'll finish up here. Then Nicodemus kind of stands up for Jesus here. Uh, we read about him earlier. Nicodemus saith unto them, verse 50, he that came to Jesus by night being one of them. So Nicodemus is one of them. And I, I mentioned earlier, I believe he was saved. I believe he did get saved. Jesus, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was one of them. He says, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? So he's just trying to give him, just cut him a little bit of slack and just saying, well, can we at least hear him out? You know, like, like before we just go and arrest him and, and you know, you guys want to kill him. Shouldn't we at least hear him out? Isn't that what the law says? If we're going to follow the law, shouldn't we at least um, you know, hear him first and know what he does? Verse 52 says, They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Again, they're using that argument of a false premise of him being from Galilee when he wasn't. But they're, say, they're, they're able to boldly say, Well, see, the Scripture doesn't say anything about Galilee. Well, that's not where he was from. That's not where he was born. Um, verse 53 says, And every man went unto his own house. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that you would please just help us all to understand the Bible a little bit more clearly. God, I pray that you would please just open up the scripture to us daily as we do our daily reading. And um, Lord, I pray that you would please bless us as we go our separate ways tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.